Friends, we welcome so many of you. Glad to have you here. We understand there are more trying to get in who can't find a seat. We are sorry about that. I told Adam I didn't get the memo that he'd gone from superstar to megastar. That's our bad. Um, this, is a, this is a wonderful event. I am, my name is Spencer Fluman. I am the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, and we are thrilled to present uh, this uh, event today with Dr. Adam Miller here from Collin College. We'll introduce him after an opening prayer. We'd like to begin with an opening prayer. We've invited Dr. Janice Johnson, a visiting scholar at the Maxwell Institute, to give that invocation. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for all of the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us and the opportunity that we have to be here together at BYU. We ask you that thou would bless us with thy spirit in this moment, that our minds and our hearts might be opened, that we might better understand thy gospel and thy will concerning us individually. We love thee very much and are thankful for all that we have, and we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Folks, just a, just a note, a couple of notes before we have uh, Dr. Miller come forward. Um, the Maxwell Institute, some of you may not know, but just a minute, just to tell you what we do and why we bring folks like uh, Dr. Miller to BYU. The Institute is dedicated to gathering and nurturing what we call disciple scholars, those scholars of religion who also uh, care deeply about the life of faith. And so we work in that intersection between the life of the mind and the life of the soul, and we try to uh, bring into our orbit those scholars who care about that intersection, and certainly Dr. Adam Miller is one of those. We would invite you to follow us on your social media outlet of choice, Maxwell Institute. Uh, you can find us through that name in all sorts of platforms, so please follow us today. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Miller, and then we'll turn the time to him. Adam Miller is a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. He earned a BA in comparative literature from Brigham Young University and an MA and PhD in philosophy from Villanova University. He's the author of eight books, including Speculative Grace, Grace is Not God's Backup Plan, The Gospel According to David Foster Wallace, and The Sun Has Burned My Skin, a modest paraphrase of Solomon's Song of Songs. Last week, Hot off the press, Deseret Book and the Maxwell Institute co-published a, sec a second expanded edition of Letters to a Young Mormon, which will be followed in May by a second co-published book between Deseret Book and the Maxwell Institute entitled An Early Resurrection, Life in Christ Before You Die. He and his wife Gwen have three children. Would you join me in, in welcoming Dr. Miller to BYU? The title of the lecture was Blair Hodge's idea, you can thank him for that. Unplugged. Thanks for coming. A lot of young Mormons out here today. Some less young than others. Lots of young Mormons. There is, I believe, exactly one seat here in front for anyone brave enough to claim it. We'll see. What happens? I'm happy to be here at BYU. I'm grateful for Spencer's invitation to come and speak. I love BYU. I love BYU the way that you still kind of love the girl from high school that broke up with you <laughs> for someone else, but you still always kind of carry a place for her in your heart. That's how I love BYU. <laughs> That's real love, though. That's real love. Uh, I want to dedicate my talk today to uh, 
Brian Krzyzniak, who some of you may know, uh, a contemporary Mormon artist. Uh, this is one of his paintings, one of my favorites of uh, Christ's descent from the cross. Just amazing. Uh, and the seed out of which this talk grew uh, came to me from something that I heard Brian say a couple months ago. In Matthew 5, 41, Jesus says, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Or, as the King James Version has it, Whoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Walter Wink has argued persuasively, in my view, that in saying this, Jesus is not talking about putting in extra effort. Jesus, at least here, is not asking his disciples to do more or try harder. Rather, this saying is about upsetting the balance of power. It's about wrong-footing evil. It's about what we might call moral creativity. This is the phrase I'm borrowing from Brian. At the time of this saying, Jesus and his people lived under the tyranny of a brutal occupation by an oppressive foreign power, the Roman Empire. In response to this tyranny, Jesus counsels neither docile submission nor violent revolt. Rather, he urges a deeper, more fundamental form of resistance that refuses to return evil for evil. He urges a form of resistance that refuses to play evil's game, a form of resistance that, by overturning life's money tables, creates an opening for justice. But how is going the extra mile a form of resistance? How is this an act of moral creativity? A little background information is helpful here. As Wink explains, in order to mitigate the anger of people in occupied countries, quote, a Roman soldier could impress a civilian to carry his pack one mile only. To force the civilian to go farther carried with it severe penalties under military law. Why then, Wink asks, does Jesus counsel his disciples to go the extra mile? Quote, Is this not to rebound to the opposite extreme, aiding and abetting the enemy? Not at all. The question here, Wink says, is how the oppressed can recover the initiative, how they can assert their human dignity in a situation that cannot for the time being be changed. The rules are Caesar's, but how one responds to the rules, that is God's. And Caesar has no power over that. Wink continues, Imagine then the soldier's surprise when, at the next mile marker, he reluctantly reaches to assume his pack, 65 to 85 pounds in full gear, and you say, oh no, let me carry it another mile. Why would you do that? What are you up to? Normally he has to coerce your kinsman to carry his pack, and now you do it cheerfully and will not stop. Is this a provocation? Are you insulting his strength? Being kind? trying to get him disciplined for seeming to make you go farther than you should? Are you planning to file a complaint, create trouble? From a situation of servile impressments, you have once more seized the initiative. You have taken back the power of choice. The soldier is thrown off balance by being deprived of the predictability of your oppressed response. He has never dealt with such a problem before. Now you have forced him into making a decision for which nothing in his previous experience has prepared him. If in the past he has enjoyed feeling superior to the vanquished, he will not enjoy it today." End quote. The upshot of this strategy is clear. By going the second mile, by seizing the initiative, you've leveraged the situation into a new shape. You forced the soldier to respond to you as an equal. This is a powerful example of what it means to live as a disciple of Christ. It's a powerful example of simultaneously loving your enemies, refusing to perpetuate inequality, and creating an opening for justice and mercy. In short, this is a powerful example of moral creativity. Now let me be clear about how I'm using this phrase. Moral creativity does not mean making up new morals. God's law is God's law. Rather, moral creativity has to do with the kind of creativity needed in order to be moral. It has to do with the kind of creativity needed to break bad habits, 
or the kind needed to breathe life back into broken relationships, or the kind needed to unbalance cycles of anger and violence, or the kind needed to see past prejudices, or the kind needed to be something more, more kind, more attentive, more humble, more aware, more responsible than I generally am. It has to do with the kind of creativity needed to do and be something new. And especially it has to do with the kind of moral creativity that regularly saves and surprises us when we start living new lives in Christ. Think about the last time you were angry with your parents or muttered something under, you bre under your breath as you tried to merge onto the freeway. How predictable was this anger? How automatic? How thoughtless, how uncreative. Think about that moment, that tiny gap of silence between what the other person did and how you, like a robot, responded. Think about how in that moment you might have done something just a little bit different, something that might have short-circuited your anger and changed the whole thing, how you might have used a different tone of voice or met their eyes or made the bed or held your head at a different angle, or surrendered the point, or noticed the light coming through the window, or smiled, or laughed, or wept. Love depends on this kind of ordinary, practical, moral creativity. Love is a fundamentally creative act. Love creates and recreates lives and worlds. Love depends on learning how to bend our ordinary lives, like a poet bends and saves ordinary words, into creative and morally responsive shapes. In this sense, love is an ethical practice with a deeply aesthetic dimension. Love doesn't just require justice and mercy, it requires beauty and creativity. In fact, beauty and creativity are essential to practicing justice and mercy as forms of love. We cannot work to inaugurate a newly just and merciful world if we are incapable of doing anything new. We can't make a difference if we are incapable of speaking and acting differently. In a world that is increasingly insulated, polarized, and predictable in its blind partisanship, we are in desperate need of young voices and new lives capable of breaking stalemates and moving unexpectedly, diagonally, in relation to the normal frozen battle lines. Like Ender in the battle room in Orson Scott Card's classic novel, Ender's Game, we need the type of moral creativity that can work in the freedom of three dimensions rather than the false rigidity of two. This freedom is both ordinary and hard to grasp, but I trust that you are familiar with it. There is, as you may know, a stillness at the heart of every experience, a kind of silence, a kind of gap, a kind of joyful emptiness, a kind of quiet that opens onto this third dimension of profoundly active freedom. It is what Mormons call the spirit or the still small voice. This dimension of spirit, this empty space adjacent to the normal and inevitable flow of time is the dimension where moral creativity is discovered and love is practiced. Devotional work like prayer, scripture study, and temple worship is meant to initiate us into this stillness and endow us with the power that flows from God through morally creative acts. The world cannot go on as it is. We must not continue living as we are. And we need you, you young Mormons, who are newer than the rest of us, to show us how in Christ to do and be something new. Part of this morally creative work turns on our shared responsibility to continually recreate and reinvent the language that we use to describe what's at stake in the unchanging stillness at the heart of a life in Christ. Part of our responsibility is to continually save old words and too familiar ideas from the oblivion that swallows everything that seems too obvious and routine. We must each, after our own fashion, using whatever tools are at our own disposal, be poets 
not necessarily poets in the sense of people who rhyme or can find a beat, but in the sense of people who can take the language they've inherited and keep it alive. I understand poets here as people who can, as Nephi says, speak with the tongue of angels and put a saving twist on words and phrases that in their familiarity we'd almost forgotten. The Christian obligation to moral creativity and thus to this form of moral poetry is a big part of what motivated me to write my book, Letters to a Young Mormon. As I think and write, especially about Mormonism, I find myself constantly groping for new ways of using old words to say things that never change. This is what it means to work in Christ with moral creativity as a moral poet. You constantly grope for new ways to use old words to say things that never change. Letters to a Young Mormon is my attempt to say, in print, and especially for my own children, something about what it means to live in Christ as a Mormon. And as I say in the book's introduction, it's my attempt to address the real beauty and the real costs of trying to live a Mormon life, hoping only to show something of what it means to live in a way that refuses to abandon either life or Mormonism. Now again, this isn't easy to do, and I suspect that every time we try, we will always fail, at least in part, as I surely have. Succeeding in part on one occasion doesn't spare us from needing to try again the next day. It can only prepare us for the next attempt. Part of what makes this creative work difficult is that it largely depends on cultivating a capacity to listen. It largely depends on our ability to be attentive and responsive. In this sense, the basic work of moral creativity and thus moral poetry is to clearly grasp the shape of the question that is being asked at any given moment so that the language used to answer it can, like a key to a lock, be filed to fit. As a missionary, I spent most of my two years in New Mexico knocking on doors, day after day after day. Some occasional good came of this. But even 20 years ago, it felt to me like I was trying to saw wood with a hammer. It felt like I was trying to answer a question that people weren't asking. As I understood it, my basic job was to convince people that my church was true. But with rare exceptions, the people I met weren't losing sleep about this. <laughs> Maybe they were wrong. But regardless, as far as they could tell, their very real, very human troubles didn't take that shape. They weren't looking for what I was offering. And if I couldn't convince them, generally in 30 seconds or so, to trade their questions for mine, then there didn't seem to be much I could do for them. Why then did I insist on, asking, on answering a question that they weren't asking? I insisted at least in part because this question, this question about which church is true, was Joseph Smith's question. Especially as we tell the story today, all of Mormonism, the Book of Mormon, the formal organization of the church, the restoration of priesthood and temple rituals, etc. It's all rooted in the fact that in 1820, Joseph's own very real, very human troubles had taken a very specific shape. For Joseph, hip deep in the charged sectarian atmosphere of New England's Second Great Awakening, everything boiled down to one question. Which of all the sects was right? as he says in Joseph Smith history. This is the original Mormon question. Compound this historical priority with the fact that this question, which church is true, remains an obvious and maybe inevitable frame for the institution's own approach to institution building, and you've got a question with staying power. A lot of contemporary research shows, though, that this way of posing religious questions may have less traction than ever. As has been widely reported, the Pew Research Center recently found that, quote, while the U.S. public in general is becoming less religious, the nation's youngest adults are by many measures much less religious than everyone else. It's you guys. 
Indeed, one of the most striking findings in the recently released religious landscape study is that millennials, young adults born between 1981 and 1996, are much less likely than older Americans to pray or attend church regularly or to consider religion an important part of their lives." End quote. More when surveyed, many millennials cited a wide-ranging distrust of religious institutions as a key reason for their disaffiliation. This shouldn't be much of a surprise. It seems obvious to me that in a world far removed from New England's Second Great Awakening, that is, in a contemporary world shaped by a profound moral hunger for equality, paired with a correlative distrust of bureaucracies and institutions, our common human problems might rarely crystallize today, as Joseph's did, as an institutional question about which church is true. I don't think this means that our deep problems are that different. Death, sickness, loss, sin, loneliness, and failure remain stubbornly universal. And I don't think this means that we don't need vibrant, principled churches and institutions. In some ways, we need them now more than ever. In short, I don't think this difference means that the Mormon practices, scriptures, rituals, and communities that have so deeply affected me and that unfolded in response to Joseph's original question are now powerless to address our suffering. Rather, just the opposite. It's my deep conviction that the door is the same. But the lock on that door, the specific shape into which each generation's experience of these same troubles crystallizes, that does appear to change. This then isn't just a missionary problem, it's a generational problem. The question isn't just how do we talk to those who don't share our faith? The more basic and urgent problem may be, how do we talk to young Mormons that do? Knowing the answers isn't the hard part. Mormons have long been confident in the answers that God revealed in Christ. The difficult thing is to recover the question. The difficult thing is to feel our way back into the question's full force to remember what it's like to live without an answer, to remember in our bones why we need an answer. And more, the difficult thing is to recognize that it's not enough to do this once or for ourselves alone. This must be done again and again, both for ourselves and for those we love. It must be done again and again because the question's specific shape the specific shape that captures the full force of life's troubles in that particular historical moment is a moving target. In this sense, an important part of our work as a tradition is to make what's obvious feel strange again, to make what's too familiar less familiar, and to recover Mormonism not only as an answer, but as a question. Doing this will position us to recognize what, in their frustration, young Mormons are trying to show us about the specific shape that their own very real, very human problems have taken. To help them, I don't need to show up at their door and tell them what ought to keep them up at night. I don't need to convince them that they're asking the wrong questions and that they should instead trade their questions for the convenience of mine. I need instead to listen. I need to let them tell me what keeps them up at night. I need to let them tell me what worries and frightens them. And in response, even if, especially if, I don't share that worry, I need to be ready and willing to mourn with them as they mourn. This, willing, this willingness to mourn with them, in all sincerity, is not optional. When we mourn together, the spirit seals our listening as genuine. If I'm willing to both listen and mourn, then I may be able to recognize and even help embody the very specific shape that Christ at that very moment aims to take in response. If I'm willing to both listen and mourn, then I may be capable of moral creativity. I may be capable of moral poetry. And then together we may be capable of starting new lives in Christ. This is, I think, 
a basic outline of the task before us as disciples of Christ. In the time that remains, I want to look at two possible examples of moral creativity. I want to think about how we as Mormons might move unexpectedly, diagonally, in relation to the normal frozen battle lines of our hyper-partisan world. That is to say, I want to look at two examples of how we might grope toward new ways of using old words to say things that never change. I take it for granted that, at least in part, I will fail in both cases. First, I want to suggest that we need to be careful about how we think and talk about Mormonism. In particular, I want to suggest that as a general rule, it's a mistake to think that Mormonism is about Mormonism. Mormonism is not about Mormonism. And if we try to force Mormonism to be about itself, we'll paint ourselves into corners and lose track of the very thing we're trying to say. Consider the following analogy. Say I'm worried about my own life. I'm worried about whether my life is good, whether I'm true to myself, whether I'm really happy. If I'm worried about my own happiness, I'll be tempted to think I should put more and more effort into securing my own happiness. I'll be tempted to think that my life is about me. This would be a serious mistake. My life is not about me. And, ironically, if I try to make my life about me, I'll be unhappy. In fact, the more I focus on my own happiness, the more fraudulent and unhappy I will feel. The right move is instead counterintuitive. I have to be willing to swim upstream against my own natural inclinations. As a result, to make the right move, I'll need faith. In many ways, an active, practical faith is just this that I'm willing to trust Christ when he urges me to not aim at my own happiness. As Christ puts it, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. This is the trick to happiness. Happiness accrues only as a byproduct. Happiness can only be found if I'm aiming elsewhere. It can only be found by forgetting myself and instead loving and serving others. I think the same thing is true of Mormonism. If I think that Mormonism is about Mormonism, I'll get stuck in the same trap. I'll miss what it means to be Mormon. In my experience, Mormonism comes into focus as true and living only when I stop looking directly at it and instead aim my attention at Christ. Instead of aiming at Mormonism, I have to aim at what Mormonism is aiming at. Otherwise, I'll miss what matters most. This is a kind of paradox, but it's exactly the kind of paradox that lies at the heart of Christianity. I will admit that it's also a kind of paradox that, at least from the outside, can look like a dodge. It can look like an easy way of sidestepping the genuinely tough questions about Mormonism. I don't deny that there are tough questions about Mormonism that need to be addressed. And in my view, this approach to Mormonism should never excuse any kind of injustice or wrongdoing. In fact, with Christ in focus, we should be robbed once and for all of any excuses. But I'm also increasingly convinced that tough questions about the ongoing integrity of Mormonism as a manifestation of the body of Christ can't be answered in the abstract. The decisive questions have to be worked out in the first person. That is to say, I have to test this for myself. I have to see for myself what happens when I aim my attention not at Mormonism, but at what Mormonism is about. What happens when instead of staring at the hand pointing toward the moon, I look straight at the moon? Other approaches may be possible, but I doubt it. If I look directly at my own life and aim directly at my own happiness, I will always find a hypocrite, an imposter, an empty suit. I will always find someone who doesn't measure up. This is inevitable because a life that is about itself 
a life that is not about loving others is fraudulent and empty. I can't see why this wouldn't also be true about Mormonism. Mormonism, when it's about itself, is an empty suit. But Mormonism, when it's true to itself, is never about itself. Mormonism, when it's true to itself, is about Christ. And when my eyes are fixed on Christ, it's my experience that Mormonism can come into focus, warts and all, as a true and living manifestation of Christ's body. That was my first example of thinking differently. Mormonism is not about Mormonism. My second example of moral creativity, my second example of looking for new ways to use old words to say things that never change, has to do with answering the prophetic call to defend the family. As the proclamation on the family warns, if we fail to defend the family, quote, the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets." End quote. Now, in addition to arguing that the differences between men and women are real and important and spiritually significant, the proclamation also boldly claims that men and women are intended by divine design to be equal partners. And without this equality, we can confidently say, as section 121 does, amen to the priesthood of that man who has attempted to, quote, exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, end quote. In this respect, it seems increasingly obvious to me that in our day, defending the family means rooting out our world's misogyny. Defending the family means defending women from both the subtle and violent forms of degradation, abuse, and marginalization that riddle our world. It means taking seriously, perhaps for the first time in the history of the world, the solemn declaration that God intends men and women to be equal partners. In my view, this will be the defining moral issue of our generation. And when we stand before the judgment bar of God, we will answer for it. We cannot continue to abide the world's casual and routine will to exploit, harass, and silence women. We must recover the full force of God's promise that in Christ, quote, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, because in Christ, everyone is, quote, an heir according to the promise. It's Galatians 3. Everyone like Christ must learn to think, speak, and act for themselves so that everyone can inherit all that God has. Part of the Restoration's great unfinished work is to flood the earth with this latter-day revelation, that every woman is a God in embryo. This is not easy work. We may belong to Zion, but we live in Babylon. This world's powers and treasures have long been commandeered by men for men. And in ways that are as ordinary as they are systemic, the world has obscured this truth and pushed women to the margins. Beyond our individual failures, these worldly ways of thinking are often baked into the languages we speak and the institutions we share. They inflect our laws, our politics, our sciences, our schools, our jobs, and our media. This misogyny is sufficiently commonplace that it surely counts as one of the world's most deeply ingrained idolatries. Men, rather than worshiping God, have made an idol of themselves in an attempt to fashion the world in their own manly image, men have disfigured it. In defense of this idolatry, was I on the wrong slide? In defense of this idolatry, the world attempts to force a choice. Either women don't get to be people, or they don't get to be women. On the one hand, the world wills women to be women but not fully human. 
by reducing them to objects of desire, angels on pedestals, prizes to be won, or images to be consumed. In this case, whether women are silenced and marginalized in the name of false religions or a global porn industry, the result is the same. On the other hand, the world wills women to be people, but not women. By urging women to worship with men, the destructive fantasy of a celebrated sovereign manhood, unbeholden to God, family, or the common good, as the truth of what it means to be human. Here, whether women are stripped of their womanhood in the name of false religions, or the frequently secular assumption that masculinity ought to be the measure of equality, the result is the same. In the first case, the worth of a woman is measured by her value in the eyes of a man. In the second case, women are pressed to take the myth of man as the measure of a valuable life. Neither position accords with what God has revealed, that women, as God's heirs, are both equal to men and not men. The delicate and difficult work of sheltering both these truths is pivotal to Christ's ongoing effort to rescue this world from its religious and secular idolization of man. In many respects, our work has barely begun. God's patience with our misogyny is, I ardently pray, wearing thin. Business as usual cannot continue. God will not suffer it to be so. Quote, I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people shall come up unto me against the men of my people. End quote. That's Jacob 2. The sun on that old world has set. Christ is already at the door, pounding with his fist, declaring that, quote, they shall not lead away captive the daughters of my people, save I shall visit them with a sore curse even unto destruction, end quote. There is nowhere to hide. The traditions of this world can provide no cover for the shining light of God's wrath. He sees us as we are. It's time for us to take a hard look at our choices and habits and idols. It's time for us to stand collectively, men and women, Mormon and otherwise, and say, no more. It's time to push the wheel of the restoration. It's time to push the wheel of the restoration another turn forward and prepare for a millennial world where under Christ's reign our prejudices, idolatries, and inequalities will be burned away by love and justice like dew before the morning sun. It's time to stop being shy about the fact that seriously defending the family means without a doubt rooting out our world's misogyny. Those are my two examples of moral creativity. In Letters to a Young Mormon, I've tried to practice this kind of moral creativity. I've, talked, I've tried to talk about the exact same things we always talk about. Work, faith, sin, prayer, worship, sex, eternal life, but from a ground floor perspective. Rather than addressing these topics with ecclesiastical authority, which I totally don't have. From 10,000 feet, I've just tried to describe them as a husband, son, and father of three in terms of the ordinary life in Christ that is mine. I want to conclude with a passage from Ashmay Hoyland's bracingly beautiful collection of drawings and personal essays called 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly also published by BYU's Maxwell Institute. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Please buy it and read it, and then buy many more copies to give away. Ashmay's book is a stunning work of deeply moral creativity. Every page is both fierce and fragile, familiar and revelatory, old and new at the same time. 
she resuscitates old words in new ways by breathing the air of ordinary life back into Mormonism's extraordinary doctrines. She enacts with great skill the kind of moral creativity I've been trying to describe. Let me give her the last word. This is about halfway through the book. She says, quote, What I want to tell you as you read these stories is that I both found and lost God a hundred times over. In fact, maybe I've never actually found God at all. But imagining that I have indeed found something so much larger and more beautiful than I can explain is most often enough for me. I believe that somewhere in all this, we belong to parents who love us with that fierce and tender love reserved for the moments when you observe a child trying their best at something. I believe we have parents who are as proud of us as I felt of my children, Remy and Thea, when despite the briskness of the afternoon, they tore off their clothes and went running across the sand and into the cold northern California waves in pursuit of all the beauty and delight this world may have to offer. When I looked out over the ocean, the waves crashing against the faraway rocks, a pelican soaring wordlessly through the blue sky, I saw for a brief moment the incomprehensible largeness of the place, with infinite beginnings and endings, both behind me and in front of me. I both found and lost God a hundred times over. I sense a powerful, parental, guiding love from heaven. I think it feels like the joy I felt when I set down all I had been carrying and ran out to my children, letting the cold waves crash over us, holding their hands when the waves tugged at our feet, the sand crabs leaving bubbling holes as they dove into the wet sand. My daughter lifted her feet and let the water pull her out while I lifted her. For me, Mormonism does not provide the ease of certain answers. It provides a language and the impetus to write about an afternoon on a beach and truly believe that maybe for that moment I had found God or else something perhaps as holy godliness. Thanks. Dr. Miller has agreed to uh, field some questions. We've got about five minutes before the class break where we know many of you will need to go. So we, we can take that for five minutes for the, and then we'll maybe pause for those who want to leave. Dr. Miller is willing to stay uh, till the hour uh, with those who can stay. So would you, st we'll, we'll, he, well, he'll call on you from here. Would you repeat their questions, Adam, so that our uh, video can pick up what you're responding to? Or restate the question that they should have asked yeah. and answer that one. Exactly. <laughs> All right, right here. Uh, the question was, how can I study Mormonism if Mormonism is aimed at something other than Mormonism without ending up aiming at Mormonism? How was that? It's a very scholarly question. You felt the way it turned in a circle. That's good. Uh, well, there are different ways to do it, right? I mean, if, for instance, if, for instance, you're a historian, uh, then you're probably going to be mostly occupied with the things that Mormonism has already actually done and been. And that's, that's fine because you're being a historian, not practicing your religion. Uh, but for me, I mean, if there has consistently been a complaint about my work in Mormon studies, it has been that I talk too much about what Mormonism is about and not clearly enough about Mormonism itself. Uh, 
And that's okay, because as a philosopher, I can do whatever I want. Uh, there aren't really any rules in this discipline. Uh, but it's okay, too, because I also feel like I'm able to get at something that way that maybe a historian can't. Because as a historian, they have to be preoccupied with Mormonism itself in a way that, as a philosopher, I don't have to be. So I'd like to think I'm making some kind of contribution that the historians, despite all of their brave and endless efforts, can't quite. Over here. She wants to know, how does rooting out misogyny look different for men and women? I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. I mean, it seems obvious to me that at least one way in which it's different is that it will involve more straightforwardly repentance on my part, uh, and maybe more forgiveness on yours. Though certainly there's often lots of blame to go around. Do you have, do you have an idea? All right, she's gonna she's gonna settle for mine for the moment <laughs> publicly. Thanks, it's that's a very good question. Uh, the lady. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting for you to decide if it was a question you could ask. <laughs> I, just, yeah. I think it is. Okay. Her, her question was, uh, how would you respond to someone who felt earnestly, sincerely, uh, that there were aspects of Mormonism, uh, maybe especially ritually in the temple, that uh, embed some of the kinds of misogyny we see at work in the world? If with the historians we take a look at the history of Mormonism, I think one of the things that becomes clear, uh, especially about Joseph Smith, is that Joseph Smith uh, was always ready and willing to take up whatever kinds of materials he found at hand and transform them in light of God's revelations toward a different end. And I think that's pretty clearly part of it, part of what's going on with the temple rituals. I mean, as it's, it's clear that he's adopting, for instance, uh, elements of things that he learned from Masonic rituals and repurposing them by way of revelation to do something different altogether. If that's true, we shouldn't be surprised, I think, that parts of the world continually bleed back into the way that we think and act and practice our religion. And part of practicing religion will always be staying engaged enough in the world that that happens, but also being vigilant about correcting that when it does. There are parts of that that are up to us as lay members of the church to address and parts that aren't. It's a good question. Uh, here in the middle. I am a phenomenologist. Yes. So, you know the word. Uh, well, my question is, how do we approach dialogue with previous generations that are a lot more keen to absolutely this idea of what we're doing is supposed to be? We need someone to write. Uh, he wants to know, how do, we not, how do we approach not only dialogue, creative dialogue with young Mormons, but how do we... Uh, engage in creative dialogue with old Mormons uh, who are in some ways a difficult problem all their own. Uh, we need someone to write letters to an old Mormon, first of all. Feels like there's a franchise waiting to be born here. 
I'm not sure that's my job, but I'd be willing to talk to somebody that wanted to take it up. I think one of the advantages of a kind of a practical approach to religion in terms of its lived experience, in terms of religion as a phenomenon, one of the advantages of that is that I think it, it can help bridge those gaps between different ways of talking because it's not focused on the talking, but about the experience that's, that's shared and that we're trying to describe maybe in different ways that, that are weak in different ways and incompatible in different ways. But, but there ought to be something, I think, and I think there is, there's a kind of kernel of experience at the heart of what it means to be a Mormon that I think can cross those boundaries. And if we focus on, if we focus on the lived experiential content, uh, then a lot of those uh, linguistic problems can maybe, they, they can be massaged away to a degree enough that we can continue to sit together on Sundays and bear testimony to each other on Sundays and come teach each other on the last day of the month. <laughs> uh, though I always tell my mother that I'm, I just do my home teaching a month in advance. <laughs> so it's actually happening on December 31st is that I'm doing January's home teaching. It's already taken care of before anyone else even worried about it. <laughs> Do we have any more? One more? Should we do one more? Ma'am? How do we, as a church, uh, help the world rid itself of its misogyny without going about it in a worldly way? Misogyny. And other things. Yeah, there are plenty of other things as well. Uh, I think that's a problem that's going to require a lot of moral creativity on the ground. But I think it's also true that the, it does seem to me there's an obvious place to start. It seems clear to me. It seems so obvious to me that it will not be possible for us to successfully defend the family if we do not successfully defend the equality of women. We cannot do the one without the other. And if we're going to be the flag bearers for the world with respect to defending the family, that will inevitably and necessarily entail that we are the flag bearers for the world of women's equality. I think that's our entry point as a church. And I think that's the obvious place for us to start as a church. And I think that's, that's, that's the work ahead of us here. Good question. Thank you. <laughs>